Today we see the music of Chopin as a technical pinnacle of piano playing, with tempo indications that in many cases are, even in our post-Rachmaninoff era, still out of reach for even the most accomplished virtuosos. But how did contemporaries describe Chopin's playing? Did they also emphasize the technical skills of Chopin the way we do today? Let's have a look at one of the most illustrious descriptions of all, that of Karl Mikuli, and see what we can learn. So welcome everybody to Authentic Sound. My name is Wim Winters and this channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and beyond with a single goal to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover. Original sources where first-hand witnesses write about what they saw and heard for sure gives lots of inspiration. There's always the difficulty, however, of a lost context in which those historical figures worked, lived and wrote. A context that changed, perhaps more than we are aware of. A context also that is very easy to fill in with our own projections to a time or musicians that we still admire and love so much. So recently we made two episodes talking on today's mainstream performances of Chopin etudes, in which it became clear that the tempi Chopin personally gave for his etudes are out of reach for even the most accomplished virtuoso players of today. In the case of the revolutionary etude, we even saw tempi that are 20 to 25% below the metronome mark of Chopin. Yet listening to those performances, the overall impression is that players like Pollini and others already play at incredible speeds. So if Chopin really was capable of playing his own tempo indications, he must have had an incredible technique that today disappeared for a reason yet to be discovered. In that case, his playing must have made an overwhelming impression on his contemporaries and not only for the beauty of his play. If Chopin really played way faster than let's say even Pollini, also his technical ability and the speeds he reached must have been described as being the first and foremost unique aspects of his piano playing. One of the most interesting descriptions of his playing is given us by Karl Mikuli in the preface of his still today excellent editions of Chopin works. Mikuli, born in 1821, studied with Chopin, became even his assistant for a while. Let's read together what, in his eyes, were the essential elements that could be described Chopin's piano technique. The first aspect he mentions is the quality of his tone. I quote, Chopin possessed a highly developed technique, giving him complete mastery over the instrument. In all styles of touch, the evenness of his scales and passages was unsurpassed, nay, fabulous. Under his hands, the pianoforte needed to envy neither the violin for its bow nor wind instruments for the living breath. The tones melted one into the other with the liquid effect of beautiful song. End of quote. So, equal scales, a quality of tone that could stand next to that of a violin seems to be the prime aspect that described Chopin's piano technique. Let's see if the second element touches upon that imaginary incredible speed he, according to what people today believe, must have had. I quote, A genuine piano hand, extremely flexible, though not large, enabled him to play arpeggios of most widely dispersed harmonies and passages in which, in wide stretches, which he brought into vogue as something never attempted before, and everything without the slightest apparent exertion, a pleasing freedom and lightness being a distinguishing characteristic of his style. At the same time, the tone which he could draw out of the instrument was prodigious." End of quote. So here we read a first novelty in his playing, the ease with which he played the most extreme arpeggios. That is something most pianists of today master completely. Seeing the piano compositions right before Chopin indeed must have been something new for his time. But not yet a single word on the warp speeds of his compositions. Let's continue. I quote. 
a lofty viral energy lent imposing effects to suitable passages, an energy without roughness. On the other hand, he could carry away his hearers by the tenderness of his soulful delivery, a tenderness without affection, but with all the warmth of his peculiarly ardent temperament. His playing was always without bidden bounds, chaste, chaste, polished, and at times even severely reserved." End of quote. So energy without roughness, lofty, at times severely reserved, that's not exactly what we would expect, assuming that an etude as for instance the revolutionary etude was played by Chopin at about 25% faster than Polini. But did Chopin care about his own metronome marks? Well, let's at the minimum say that the burden of proof is on those who deny it. But let's see what Mikului has to say about this. In keeping time, Chopin was inflexible, and many will be surprised to learn that the metronome never left his piano. Confusion on metronome marks also those of Chopin only occurred late in the 20th century, as you will see in some future episodes. Metronome marks in the 19th century and especially in the first half were considered always, with no single exception, as accurate, exact indications of the composer's own tempi. Also with Chopin. But in that case we have two options. Either he played his works, like for instance the revolutionary etude in a substantial faster tempo than for instance Polini. If you digital speed Polini's tempo, tempo up, that must have sounded like this. And if you still want to dream further, thinking that this must have been possible for Chopin and his generation, and you want to continue your search to aspects on why human beings of today are not capable anymore of doing what must have been so easy two centuries ago, you have all freedom to continue that path. Or you rethink the current projections to that time. Consider those players and composers as human beings who were two centuries behind us in technical development. And then the old historical metrical reading of the metronome makes perfectly sense. In this system that goes back to the menstrual notation even, the indication of time, tempo, is by definition a twofold unity. A metronome equation of for instance half note 80 is read according to that principle. The half note is the binary unity of two parts, or two quarter notes in this case. The metronome number indicates the speed of the parts of the intended time, as also the Melzel 1817 instruction describe. The note value in this example, the half note, represents the time tempo, again something that by definition is to be measured in two points. It gives the meter of the speed, hence the name metronome. In this direction, this etude must have sounded more as I recorded it a few weeks ago. that in future episodes also the Melzel instructions will see daylight here on authentic sound. There is so much to be shared here. I thank you all for watching and reflecting with me on this fascinating subject. Again do not forget that we are all at the same side here and let's especially keep enjoying each other's performances no matter what standpoint is taken. If you want to see more of this then hit that subscribe button, also hit the bell icon also for the live streams and if you really want to push us all the way to keep going you might want to become a patron for Authentic Sound and join a group of about 80 other supporters. We have monthly video calls in which we chat about anything, also tempo. So thank you all and see you soon again. Bye.